next lecture is Yael Levy. Dr. Yael Levy. Yael Levy is currently postdoctor fellow at the Halperin Center for the Study of Jewish Self Perception at Bar Ilan University here. Her PhD from the, Hebrew, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem focuses on the emergence of the Hebrew and Yiddish press in the United States between 1870 and 1900. Her current research project depicts the phenomenon of uh, suicide among Jewish immigrants in the United States during the age of mass immigration, which is a very serious and interesting topic. She recently published the book, The Spirit That uh, Materializes uh, materials Bear, uh, Selected Poems, a uh, bilingual edition of Dvora Fogel's Poetry and, Mono, uh, and Montex, right? Montex, translated into Hebrew from the original Yiddish with, the afterward, with and afterwards. Sorry. And her lecture is uh, uh, the sun, the sun in yellow streets. Dvor Fogel's avant-garde Yiddish poetry in a Jewish tra tra uh, transitional context. Uh, good afternoon. The poetics of Dvor Fogel, born in Boston in 1900 and murdered in Lviv in 1942 was an avant-garde Yiddish project. Fogel, an art critic, theoretician, poet, and translator, published two collections of Yiddish poetry, Togfiguren in 1930 and Manikinen in 1934, and literary prose, Akatsias Blien in 1935, as well as theoretical essays in Yiddish and Hebrew and poetry translations into Polish. A woman, a Yiddish poet, and an avant-garde writer, and a Galician Jew, Fogel had various marginalities. Fogel's work was misjudged, or more frequently unnoticed. Recent interest in her work resulted in new translations, scholarship, and public attention to her unique contribution to interwar Yiddish avant-garde culture. In the frame of this talk, I will present a close reading of one of Fogel's poems, to offer an analysis of her poetic style as a Yiddish avant-garde artist. Fogel was part of, a, of the vibrant Polish modernist scene of the interwar period. She was involved in avant-garde artistic circles in Lviv. She was inspired by movements such as Cubism and Surrealism and by philosophical ideas on the concept and meaning of art. Although Fogel lived in Lviv, she was herself, she saw herself as part of a broader transatlantic modernist Yiddish culture, as evident from a correspondence with Yiddish introspectivist writers in New York, Fogel felt an affinity to this specific culture, milieu, and poetic school. In a letter to the New York-based Yiddish poet Aaron Glantz Leeles, who was one of the founders of the literary periodical Inzich, she wrote, this is the original letter uh, in Yiddish, it's uh, at the Yivo archives, and this is a uh, translation into English. Dear A. Leales, your essay about the fate of modernism in Yiddish literature is worthy of discussion, even in a time like ours, which seems to have no time for questions of form and art. The failure of Yiddish modernism, as you call it, is very important. The same phenomenon is noticeable in all literatures which develop at a slower pace, for instance, in Polish literature. Only at a high level of literary development will the avant-garde be accepted as an element of culture and defined as such. Yiddish literature, which in fact doesn't have any control over, it, over itself and which has no foundation in its own specific life, continuously limits itself. We can't, God forbid, go too far. The stages of development shouldn't be skipped. And at a time a contemporary person has no place here and nothing to do, Every issue of Inzich is thus a greeting and a confirmation that there are other people in Yiddish literature as well. Avant-garde culture, according to Fogel, is a high form of art that is unfortunately not appreciated in Yiddish literature. 
Therefore, the affinity between Fogel and fellow Yiddish modernists was necessary. The American introspectivists and Fogel rejected traditional forms and employed narrative fragmentation, free verse, and a focus on the individual experience. More specifically, Fogel and Leyeles introduced Cubist idea into Yiddish poetry. It was a mutual relationship. Fogel corresponded with Yiddish New York introspectivists and published her poems in Inzich and Boden. Simultaneously, in her Yiddish literature periodical, Zustayen, she published contributions from New York writers such as Malkali, Abbas Stolzenberg, and Weil Teller. Her last sentence, every issue of Inzich is thus a greeting and a confirmation and that there are other people in Yiddish literature as well, tells us something about her feeling of foreignness, of otherness, in contemporary Yiddish literature. Indeed, from the perspective of artistic genres, Fogel is considered avant-garde and marginal. She was a Cubist Yiddish poet. In Cubist art, geometric forms and fragmentation of shapes, of shapes represent reality. A multiplicity of viewpoints, monochromatic colors, and mechanization reflect the modern experience. The materiality is a geometric element, and the focus on colors and shapes are at the core of her work. Let's see this element in one of Fogel's most unique poems. Um, I will read the Yiddish original and then the English translation. Die Zun in Gelle Gassen. Die Heiser sind in Gelle Blech Quadraten auf a blauen Tuch geworfen. In kantige Gassen von Gellen Streifen Metall schmeckt mit kleppigen Licht, mit kleisterigen Blech und wasserdicken Gloss. Die Zun ist ein gläserne Maranskoil zwischen blecherne Gelle Blätter von Heiser. Of blecherene teller von Gassen. In metallene Gassen kreist it an einziger Leib, die gelle Zu. Der Zunleib is a sissere Last, wie zwei Brustkegeln mit weißer Milch, a leichtere Last, wie fallen dicke Blumen redlich von weißen, schmecken dicken Blech. Zu was noch gehen zu a zweiten Leib mit Hand und Fiss. Die Zun is a Leib, a heißer. Und schleppt in Gassen. And this is the English translation. Um, so what is avant-garde in this poem? And where is the cubism? And aside of the fact that Fogel is something else, I think it is very uh, clear. Uh, so first, the shapes in the materials, raw materials and geometric forms, such as rectangle, a lion, an ellipse, or a sphere, are at the focus of Fogel's writing. She uses monochromatic colors, especially the gray palette, and a plastic language in phrases like sticky light or watery glass. Peter Berger defined the technique of montage as the hallmark of any avant-garde. In this poem, the montage deconstructs the space, it is not a coherent image of a street with houses, but rather a cluster of colors and geometric shapes, yellow, orange, and blue, squares, spheres, and tables. For Fogel, language itself becomes material for constructing the poetic reality of urban life and its overlooked elements. <clears throat> the sun is an orange sphere of glass between the thin yellow tables of houses over thin platters of streets. That is a cubist image. The object of the sun is deconstructed to its element, the color, orange, the material, glass, and the shape, sphere. The houses and streets are not concrete, but a collection of geometric shapes and colors. So far, we are in the realm of modernist avant-garde art. And at this point, the image might even remind us of a cubist painting, such as this one, maybe. Albert Glez was a 20th century French philosopher and a Cubist artist. Um, he wrote the first major treatise on Cubism in 1912. This painting is titled Cubist Landscape, Tree and River. It was created in 1914 and reproduced in the German art and literary magazine Der Sturm in October 1920. Like the poem, the painting presents a landscape, although here it's not a, a city with streets, but a tree and a river. Geometric shapes, bright colors, and multiple angles represent the tree and the river, like Fogel streets and houses. The colors are blue, thin gray, and various shades of orange. 
and above all, the giant yellow sphere of the sun. So if the poem ended at this point, we could have said it's a perfect example of cubist poetry in Yiddish. But then comes the lion. <clears throat> in meadow streets walks around now a single lion, the yellow sun. <coughs> the sun lion is a sweet wake, like two breasts filled with white milk, a lighter weight, like flower bouquets falling of white fragrant, fragrant tin. They start separately, a single lion, the, lion, the yellow sun, but then they become one, the sun lion. The lion transforms again. It becomes a weight, a contradictory one, heavy yet light, sweet and fragrant. It is a warm energy, a hot light. It also transforms from feminine to masculine. Dizun becomes their lab. In the English transla translation, this is lost, but in Hebrew it works as well. Hashemish he ha'ariehu. And the sun lion takes us from the cubist world into the magical realist world, which is, which is also a unique feature of Fogel's writing. Why would you go to another lion with hands and feet? The sun is a lion, a burning lion. It drags around the streets. To understand these lines, we must consider Fogel's poetic and artistic logic. Fogel wrote essays in Yiddish and in Polish, which have been discussed and analyzed by contemporary literary scholars. Recently, I discovered she had written in Hebrew on matters of art and poetics in the Lviv-based Hebrew journal Hasolel, edited by Yaakov Netaneli Rotman, head of the Hebrew Seminary for Teachers in Lviv. In a short essay from 1933 titled Understanding Modern Art, Fogel wrote, we must use now a new artistic term, the concept of figurative content. Analyzing this term will lead us to the right approach to art. There are orders of reality, and each of them stands fully for itself, the natural reality of life and figurative reality. These two orders are related to each other. The material for the artistic reality draws on the natural reality of life, since art doesn't have any other source for materials for figures. So Fogel's writing is complex and multi-layered, but let's look at this basic, though very innovative observation. There is a natural reality and a figurative reality, and they are separate and whole. And the figurative reality is not inferior to the natural one. So when we read, <clears throat> why would you go to another lion with hands and feet? The sun is a lion. That is the core of Fogel's poetic argument. There is no need to look for reality. The sun is a lion. The zone is a lake. The figurative reality is as valid as the natural reality. And this concept can also explain the sharp contrast between the poetic scene of a lion in the streets and the actual scene of the sun on yellow streets. If we try to put in plain words the scene, the, the image of the poem, it is static and uneventful. Nothing happens. There are streets, and there is a sun in the streets. No action, no human figures, not a single event. Yet the poetic scene is dramatic and breathtaking, and a burning lion walks around the streets. That is a modernist point of view and one of Fogel's most distinct fingerprints. Within the banal and the uneventful lies the dramatic core of life and poetry. A lion invades the urban material scene and the poem continues as if this is part of everyday life. And that is where Fogel departs once again from the literary and artistic norms of realism and even cubism and brings her innovative poetic element. And as she wrote to Leilis, at times a contemporary person has no place here and nothing to do. In this context, the sun lion might be Fogel herself, a single lion, a hasten, und schlecht in Gassen. 
um, I want to <clears throat> conclude with a beautiful observation of Fogel on the concept of Jewish art. In a short article from 1933 in Hebrew, also in Hasolel, dedicated to the Jewish-Polish artist Leopold Pilichowski, Fogel discussed the, the possibility of a Jewish element in art. And she writes, It is clear that this Jewish element cannot be found in a Jewish theme, since the theme proved to be ridiculous and demonstrated its fragmentation. This Jewish element must be looked for in an irrational thing and yet real, something which is hidden in the rhythms of the line and nuance of the image. Um, I think this is a very accurate observation of Fogel's own poetry, its irrationality and realism, the hidden line and the nuances of the poetic style. The obligation to look at things that are by definition unseen is an aesthetic principle, but it is no less an ethical imperative. And this is what makes Vogel, in my opinion, not only a unique and, very, and a brilliant avant-garde poet, poet, but also a very Jewish one. Thank you. I don't know if a Cubist Yiddish uh, uh, school, uh, but but Leilis and and Fogel uh, were, were Cubist poets, and and Fogel herself uh, she was part of the Artes group, which is which was a, an art group uh, in Lviv, and Henrik Streng, um, which illustrated her some of her uh, poetry books, was also part of this uh, of this group and uh, and, uh, and an artist um, in his own right. And so I, th I think this is this is what th this is a local uh, context of her of her uh, of her art of her uh, uh, philosophical and uh, thinking about art, uh, and and she was also um, she met with Marc Chagall and she 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 knew a lot of, about contemporary avant-garde um, <clears throat> art and Cubism, of course, um, and I think. Uh, her language is so unique, it's so plastic. Uh, it's 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 cubism in words, uh, as uh, as as she herself defined it. Uh, but it is it's more than that. Uh, it's, so in this example, I think the lion uh, gives us this sense that it, she, she can write cubism in Yiddish, but she has something more. Uh, she has some this magical realism. She has this very um, unique um, look on things that are really unseen that I, I think goes beyond cubism uh, in, which is very uh, very fogel <laughs> I think and, and really nothing no, nobody else writes like this it's like Poland is like in between Russia and mm -hmm. like Western Europe is there any specificity
he displayed to me in Russian. Even with the gender, the red smart is just two possibilities. One is yeah. more Russian and one more uh, German, Polish, and so on. Yeah. Um, It's, it's, it's a very interesting question. I don't know if I can answer like a full answer now, but I, I do think because your poetry is so concrete and so, uh, and so um, obligated to her own um, aesthetics and ethics, I don't know if I would put it in, in, a, in a group, like in a... Um, Although I'm sure she read everything, but I'm not sure she would she would um, she would feel comfortable in any of these groups, and and um, maybe maybe the American scene is actually more accurate in this context because she saw herself as part of the interesting and introspectivist, and also she felt this. Uh, concrete sense of foreignness to her surroundings. So this not being part of a group and not, not belong to any specific group is a feature of her. So, um, but that, that's the beginning of, of an answer. <laughs> thank you very much. Any more questions? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for this. I'm actually going to be teaching mannequins Mm -hmm. this semester, so I was taking a lot of notes, and I was very disappointed that the poem you uh, focused on was from uh, uh, Paul Figo, mm -hmm. because I could really <laughs> use some help with that, you know, but um, I really got a lot out of this. I, um, there's a couple things, first in terms of your conversation just now with Roy, I think that, you know, the idea of where female artists exist in these Yiddish avant-garde movements is really important because these movements were put together very consciously as boys clubs. And, you know, for Dvorah Fogel to identify with the Enza Histon is also a means of advertising. She's not in New York. Because if she had been in New York, then her relationship with the movement would probably have been rather different. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at the quote that you, that you ended this extract from her essay in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. The Jewish element must be looked for in an irrational thinking and yet real. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what this means. Um, but I wonder if this is somehow connected to what you were quoting at the beginning of your presentation in her response to what Leolis is talking about, the failures of Yiddish modernism. Now, I don't think that Yiddish modernism was a failure. I would be out of a job if I did. You know? uh, but I wonder if that notion of the incompatibility of the obligation of the avant-garde artists to write about, to incorporate, to embody everything, and this need for a Jewish particularism that even in Zip embraces, I wonder if that's connected to what Fogel is talking about here. I mean, you know, what, what is the Jewish element for her if it is both irrational and real? Is it some kind of like math theory, like some kind of number that's represented by a letter or something? <laughs> or? Um, yeah, I actually think this is... Um, Irrational thing and yet real is is uh, is very present in this poem. Like a lion in the street is irrational thing and yet real in the poem. Uh, so and I think. But, but is it Jewish? Yeah. So so uh, so I think so. Yeah, I think it is because uh, I think part of of of, of being Jewish. <laughs> means that uh, you can uh, think of things that are both irrational and yet real. It is, it is part of, if, if you are uh, educated in a Jewish uh, traditional um, school or, or family, so you have this ability to look at things that are irrational and yet real. It's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a method. 
Um, and, and maybe it is hard to understand, but I think it is not that hard to identify uh, when you see it in reality. And I think um, she, did, she did see a lion in the streets. I also think she saw herself as a lion in the streets in, in this context. And, and so I think, yes, this is uh, um, a Jewish uh, idea or a Jewish notion. And you can find it also in Chagall's. Uh, paintings and in Bono Schultz's uh, writing, uh, this it, it is a concept um, that an artist uh, uh, can imagine, and um, and I think also um, everyone who was raised uh, in a traditional way who who, uh, who had uh, to daven, <laughs> I guess, uh, could could uh, could think of so, uh, and I and I also. This is why I think she goes beyond cubism. Because it's not just uh, shapes and colors. There is a soul in these, in, in these shapes and colors. There is a soul in this um, image. Um, and, I, and I think this is uh, a Jewish uh, idea or a Jewish concept. Yes, please. shapes and colors. Shapes and colors is geometrical part. Cubism has something else. Mm -hmm. Cubism has the notion of looking at the same time from different points of view. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is what we should look for in the point. And not only when she said the square and the flat. These are only very uh, basic mm -hmm. geometrical notions that cubism is something else. And yeah. here I think something that is very surprising for me is that she's talking about line. Line, line is not in cubism language. Line, cubism is volumes and not lines. And when she's talking about line, she look in, for an answer in another field, not in cubism. In my, I think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think that this is very surprising to hear about the line. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think she she goes beyond cubism, and she 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 uses it, but she goes beyond. She has something else to say. Um, and, but I I agree. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.